we want to talk about is now simple sets. Um, starting with the definition. So we say an infinite set is immune um, if it contains uh, no infinite CE set. So this is something, or, or a notion that falls into the same area as, as when you're thinking about productive and creative, where we had these sets, right? We wanted to say is that it's not approximable by uh, a CE set. For productive, it meant if the infinite CE set is contained in there, then we can find an element which shows the difference between these things. Here we're just saying, okay, uh, we're going to make... Uh, these immune sets, they are, they are so thin that they don't even contain an infinite CE set. And, and, and then we say that a CE set is simple uh, if um, uh, its complement is immune. So its complement is infinite but does not contain uh, an infinite CE set. The first thing you observe from this then is that uh, right, simple means uh, certainly not computable. Because if it was computable, the complement is infinite, but then it should be uh, computable by the complementation theorem, and so the complement is CE uh, contradiction. Uh, it also means Not creative. Uh, and now you remember that the, the, the crea creativity of sets was introduced to kind of analyze completeness. Uh, and so this was another attempt at, at trying to come up with, with uh, a characterization of complete sets that, that unfortunately also failed. But, but still, in studying it, we will see lots of interesting construction methods and, and things like that. So um, even though it doesn't do what it was originally intended to do, it still does interesting things. Um, so not creative, because any creative set has in its complement an infinite CE set, right? You start with the empty set, it's the CE set contained in there, and then using the production function, you could one after the other stick in more and more elements into the complement, getting an infinite CE set, and, 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 and uh, these symbol sets don't have that. Therefore, also, uh, Not M complete because creative and M complete was the same. It doesn't mean uh, you couldn't get something else out of it, but, but at least uh, M complete. So this is very nice. Uh, we've defined this notion. We can make some, some simple observations about of it. About it. Uh, and you could wonder, first of all, about existence. And, and we will wonder about that for a little bit, but there does exist a simple set. Right? So again, what do we want? A simple set is a CE set with additional properties, so our, our construction of course follows the, exactly the usual pattern. Do computable stuff while doing the computable stuff every now and then, say, and stick this into the set. Uh, then we get a CE set. And, and, and it also follows the usual pattern that we just write on uh, before doing the construction. We say, okay, a simple set is such a CE set that satisfies uh, requirements. What are the requirements? If, if the CE set E is infinite, then we need that WE intersect A is not empty. Well, and the standard thing that you might do uh, once you write down the requirements, uh, first of all, I should say clearly, if all PE are satisfied, then the set is simple. Well, almost, right? 
what is, which part of the requirement is not contained in the PE? The complement has to be infinite. The complement has to be infinite, right? All PE are easily satisfied by taking A the set of all natural numbers, uh, and, and, and that is, uh, of course, a fascinating set, but, but not in our current context. We want the complement to be infinite, so, so this needs to be part of our construction to make the complement infinite, but if we succeed in making the complement infinite, satisfying all these requirements, we're in business. Right? Also, uh, I, I, I didn't do this in, in the earlier proofs, but a standard way to start such a proof is to say, okay, how would you satisfy a single such requirement? The, uh, the, the strategy for satisfying a single such requirement is usually very easy, you don't have to think very hard, and then the only thing you have to do later on is to analyze how, how can I modify the strategy for a single requirement to take care of all requirements. Uh, strategy for a single requirement is easy, enumerate WE, at some point you find an element in WE, you take it into A. Right. Notice that that's all very computable, you just start enumerating WE. Uh, so as time goes by, you compute it further and further and further, and, and if ever an element shows up in WE, you can stick it into A. If it never shows up, ah, then it was already satisfied, it was empty. Uh, so, so now we have, have analyzed everything separately, we just need to combine it. What is the problem? Well, you run all these W, all these PE, these these basic requirements for the for the basic strategies for the PE, and, and if you do this blindly, then it's very likely that along the way every natural number gets enumerated into A. So, so this this is, uh, as far as I can see it, and, and I, as far as I could see it when I wrote my notes as well, this is as I as I see the only kind of thing where you need a little care. Make sure that in these basic modules, the, the one that works for one thing, that they don't interfere with each other in the way that everything gets enumerated into A. That's the only difficulty. So, of course, again, by stages, at stage zero, we just say A of zero uh, is empty. Uh, it's uncommon to start a CE set by already sticking something in there. But then, at stage S plus 1, so, so you want to, just like usual again, be a little bit organized about it, and, and how, do you, how are you organized about it? Well, you're going to come up with some, well, at any stage, infinitely many PE are not yet satisfied. You look for the least PE which is not yet satisfied about which you feel you can do something. So, so what is this? Well, you look for the least e such that w e s intersect a s is empty, right? The, the, this says that at this point in time, in the computable way, it appears the requirement p e is not satisfied. Um, and, and what else do you want? Well, and you want that there exists an x such that x is in W E S. But this is sort of your prototypical situation. You know, there's little room, right? This is not quite it. This is sort of your prototypical situation. P E is not yet satisfied, but you have an x which you could use to satisfy P E. Right? You could take this x, enumerate it into A, and be done with it. Um, also notice that, that, that if you do this, I, I guess I should have said that earlier when we analyzed the requirements in isolation, but as soon as you take anything from WE and you enumerate it into AS, the requirement PE is once and for all satisfied. No later work will take x out of A, so, so, so every requirement requires at most one action. Uh, and so, if we take this as the, the condition we check, take this x, enumerate it into A, then we have exactly the difficulty of maybe enumerating too much into A. So what do we do? We say, okay, we just look for an x, uh, which is big enough. 
if right we don't uh, we don't care about finite sets if this set is infinite then certainly it will contain lots of things greater than any fixed bound and so if this set is infinite then either at some point accidentally we will already have made this intersection unempty or at some point we will find an x like this and then we'll take the x and stick it in there um, this is it, we're done right? Uh, what do we have? we have a construction where we do computable stuff uh, and as we do computable stuff every now and then we find such an x and we stick this, we take this x and enumerate it into a. Right? I guess I say here least e for which there exists an x, then find the least such x for that least e and take it and enumerate it into a. Then you have a completely deterministic procedure where you do computable stuff every now and then stick something into a. Um, so this makes a c e. It makes all the p e satisfied because right. Uh, suppose not all PE are satisfied, take the least PE which is not satisfied, then all the ones below at some point no longer will never appear again in, in this condition. Therefore, as soon as into that WE something appears greater than 2E, we'll enumerate it in and take care of it. So we have a CE set which satisfies all requirements PE and we just need to see the last condition that its complement is infinite. Okay, why is its complement infinite? Well, on, on behalf of every requirement PE, we at most once take action. Right? As soon as you take action, condition is satisfied, will never require attention again. What, what does it mean to take action? Enumerate one thing in. Okay, what does this mean? Well, it means among the first two e elements, or among the first two e natural numbers, only requirements one up to e could possibly enumerate an element into a. Right? There is a, there are at most e requirements that might take action on elements less than two e. Which means that among the first two e elements, you will enumerate at most e elements into the set a. Uh, therefore, the complement of A is infinite. Hmm? Isn't it enough to just take x bigger than the e plus 1 then? Uh, or maybe e plus 2? Uh, no, because you could leave out 0 and 1 and then enumerate everything in there. Is that right? Right? The, uh, if requirement e enumerates na a natural number e plus 2 in to the set, mm -hmm. then it wouldn't work. Yeah. Okay. Um, sparse net, would you use like 2 to the e <coughs> or e squared, things like that? You want something which, which, which grows sufficiently fast. Uh, but we will see pretty soon, uh, pretty soon, where is this? Uh, Oh, listen, the exact next theorem is, uh, is, the, is the theorem which shows that, right? Uh, uh, first, are there other questions about this one before I move to the next one? Yes. Clearly, it's such an easy I'm struggling with this. So. Oh, no, no. So, okay. so, so, so this is, look for the least e such that this happens. If you find it, then take the least x enumerated. If you don't find it, Pass which will happen S quite S often, in fact, okay. just do nothing. Okay. Yes. That's the usual choice, and yes. therefore I, I don't even okay. notice that I made it anymore. Uh, other questions? Okay. So, definition. Um, is effectively simple if um, there exists an F which is computable such that 
for every E, if W E is contained in A complement, W E is one of the C E sets that's in A complement. Okay, being simple means that W E needs to be finite. Being effectively simple means that you know how finite the cardinality of W E is less than or equal to F E. Right? Effectively simple means you have an upper bound on how big these sets are. Notice that that's kind of what happens here. We don't wait until we really start believing that WE is infinite, and, and when would you start believing that anyway, but, but you wait until you get a sufficiently large element appearing. Well, any set which is larger than 2E plus 1 will have elements greater than 2E. Right? So any set which is larger than 2E plus 1 uh, will already satisfy PE. Right? I, I really did. These requirements. If, uh, if it's a sufficiently large finite, then um, uh, then uh, uh, we make this intersection non empty. So, uh, uh, your immediate question, but uh, okay, 2e, uh, how, how bad can you make it? Well, uh, uh, you can make it. Uh, there is a simple, oh, there is an effectively simple set A, uh, uh, which is effectively simple through F of E is equal to E. And you go back to the previous construction we did, and you notice that clearly that construction fails for the obvious reasons that uh, if you try to do this construction with 2e replaced by e, a will be all the natural numbers in the long range. So uh, we, uh, we need to do something different. And uh, it, it turns out that the, the right different thing to do is a movable marker construction. It's just really nice because we learned about movable markers not too long ago, so, so we get a little refresher. Okay, so what do I want? I want that if, right, same requirements of course, same basic strategy that, that for every WE, if you want to act on it, you want to take something from WE and stick it into A, that, all the same analysis ahead of time. But now we want to say, okay, if W E is greater than E, th then that should already be big enough that we that we get to take action, which which we couldn't with this method. So, so. Okay, so what is our strategy? Movable markers. What did we know about movable markers? Well, uh, uh, the movable marker strategy is at stage S. You already have a S, and now uh, we, right? we label the complement in increasing order, and we think of the, the, the labels of the complement as the current locations of these movable markers. Uh, then we're going to do some computable stuff, and depending on the computable stuff we do, we say, well, enumerate this element into the set or move it and all markers greater one step to the right. right? These are sort of the uh, different ways of saying the exact same way and the second about moving the markers clearly fits better with the name of the strategy. So we have this uh, and now we also know from our earlier analysis what we want is a complement eventually to be, uh, to be infinite and, and we had a nice analysis about these movable markers. You make the complement infinite if every marker eventually comes to a rest. It was completely equivalent, right? The complement is finite if and only if one marker moves infinitely much. So we can make the complement finite by making every marker move finitely often. And, and then you immediately realize that we are in business for that because if we let, if we let marker <coughs> i only be moved on behalf of finitely many of the PE, 
then marker i will only move finitely much because for every pe we do one action and, and so that's it and, and that's exactly what we do in our construction at stage s plus one we say okay look for the least e such that and again if it doesn't exist do nothing look for the least e such that w e s intersect a s is empty uh, P is not already satisfied accidentally because of other work or because of further actions we took. And uh, there exists an I greater than E such that AIS uh, is in WES. Right, and this says exactly requirement PE needs attention, it's not already taken care of. And we have found a marker, something which is in the complement of A, which is currently in WES. So, so now you could say the right action at this point is to take this least marker that has this property and enumerate it into A, or take the least marker and move it and all the bigger ones one step to the right. Um, and, and then you see that exactly what I promised would happen, that on behalf of requirement PE, we only get to move markers AI where I is greater than E. So that means that uh, the ith marker only gets to be moved on behalf of PE where E is strictly less than I. That means the ith marker can only move uh, I or I minus one or I plus one many times. Right? Uh, uh, can't count these things. Uh, so now, did, did I succeed at making at making this function exactly the right one? Well, as soon as W E S has strictly more than E elements, either this will automatically be satisfied, or at some point the E plus first element will be enumerated, and then we have e plus 1 elements, which are all in the complement of A, if we have e plus 1 elements in the complement, then one of them has an index greater than e in, in this enumeration. Right? And, and again, maybe I should say e plus 2, or add or subtract 1 in all the appropriate locations to make it exactly work out. I, I, I can't check these things. You can make it thinner and thinner and thinner. All you want is that uh, every marker moves only finitely much, so, so, so this E can be replaced by anything which just uh, eventually goes off to infinity. So any slow enough, any slow growing function, as long as, as it, it slowly grows off towards infinity, will be uh, usable for an effectively simple set. Which makes the complement really thin, right? You, you, the complement doesn't even contain, in some sense, large finite cells. The large depends on the index, obviously, but uh, that's what happens. Good. Questions? Okay, so then uh, again I, said, uh, I, I, I started by talking about this thing, okay, simple sets were another one of these attempts to show, to find the characterization of complete sets, uh, and I said it fails, so uh, how does it fail? Well, it fails, um, Okay, 
Simple sets cannot be computable, right? That was our first observation. Uh, anything other than that, it fails. Which is to say, uh, for every non-computable CE set C, uh, there exists a simple set A Turing reducing to T, right? Give me a measurement of how simple you want the simple set to be, and, and I can make it simpler than that. That's, that's what this theorem is saying. Right? As long as it's CE non-computable, you stay away from the zero degree, above anywhere there, uh, you can find simple sets. And, and, and this proof is uh, uh, in particular in noise because uh, it is the, the, the first example of a strategy called the, the permitting strategy or the permitting method. What we're going to do is we're going to build our simple A. Well, we have, we have multiple ways to build simple A now. But, but um, what happens is that in the construction of the simple set A, every now and then we have to stick something into the set A. But, but you're trying to make this Turing reducible. A should be Turing below C. That certainly doesn't mean that you can just, whenever you please like it, stick things into A. You need to somehow be nice with respect to C in your sticking stuff into A. So what is going to happen in the strategy? This is why it's called permitting. I'm only going to stick an X into A if C explicitly gives me permission to do so. That's going to be my strategy. And now if I can come up with a coherent notion of C giving me permission to do it, uh, then uh, uh, we're all set. So, here we go. First, uh, C is uh, a CE set, so it has a signal 1 uh, approximation CS, a computable sequence increasing of finite sets that, that uh, such that C is a union of all the CS. And uh, then uh, we're going to build again a simple set, so our requirements should be of the form. If WE is infinite, then uh, WE intersect A is going to be uh, non-empty. Those were exactly the requirements we had before, and, and now we're going to do something incredibly silly. Uh, I'm going to change my requirements to say, if WE is infinite, then either this intersection is non-empty, which is what I want, or C is computable. <laughs> Uh, now, this is fairly ridiculous because C is not computable, but, but, but what happens is that we are formulating the requirement like this, then we come up with our basic strategy to work on this, the basic strategy will satisfy exactly this requirement. And, and then from this we can conclude, because C is indeed non-computable, that we can never choose the second option, and we always have to choose the first option. Even though a priori, according to our basic strategy, both options would be would be possible. Uh, okay. So uh, um, let me just give the construction and then talk about talk about it concretely what happens instead of keeping with this abstract nonsense. Okay. Obviously, at stage zero, we choose a the empty set. And now, uh, at stage S plus 1, uh, we look for the least E such that WES intersect AS is empty. Requirement PE has not already been taken care of. And there exists an X greater than 2 to the E such that x is in w, e, s. Right? If, if I now stopped, then we had exactly the construction we had before. Uh, 
look for a requirement which is not yet satisfied, which has a sufficiently big witness which could satisfy it. Uh, so that's exactly the construction we had before, but now I want to get permission from C to use this X. What does it mean, permission from C? Well, suppose you have such a Turing uh, reduction, then uh, you, you kind of have that the value of A of X, whether X is in there or not, right? at this current stage, it, it looks like a computation like this, you, you're, you're using the oracle, um, you're using the current approximation for the oracle, oh, this should be nice here, but you're using the current approximation for the oracle to, to decide this membership. So, so, how can you change this value? Well, it means that in this computation, the only way this computation can change its mind is if the oracle changes. Right? The, the, the output of this computation, if, if E and X are fixed, the output of this computation can only change if the oracle changes. And so this is exactly what we mean by getting permission from C. We, we can put X into A if C changes on a sufficiently small value, if it changes below the use. Uh, and, and in this case, this means... Uh, one part. And uh, C S plus one up to an encoding C is different than C S X. But we only get to stick this X into A if there is a change inside of C at X for a smaller value. So, so C changes at a sufficiently small place means that uh, a computation in some sense gets reset. Now, now I'm clearly not defining the computation here, the, the Turing reduction, but, but uh, that's where the idea comes from, from this idea that the oracle needs to change for the output value to change. <coughs> and and that now I need to argue that there really is such an E after the fact. But I didn't have such an E yet, but I need to argue after the fact that there is such an E, and, and, and then you could see that now that I have such an E, that the permission really was permission in the change of the oracle. Um, right? Everybody happy-ish with this? Okay, so, so now we need to make our observations. Um, well, a complement is infinite for exactly the same reason as before. Amongst the first two E elements, there is only E requirements for which you might take an action. Therefore, there is only at most E elements which you would enumerate in. Therefore, the complement of A amongst the first two E elements is at least of size E. Therefore, the complement is infinite. Um, uh, and we get uh, A. Turing reduces to C, so this is the part where I argue that, that, uh, uh, that I came up with my strategy by pretending I already had a Turing reduction, but I didn't, so now I need to find that there really is a Turing reduction. Well, but what happens? Uh, both of them are CE sets, right? We do computable stuff and every now and then say, stick this into A. So both sets are CE, uh, and, and we have this nice thing, observation that if the um, if m of a is less than or equal to m of c, right? The modulus function. Uh, if the modulus functions are ordered in this way, then the one Turing reduces to the other. And, and this is exactly what happens. We only allow a change at x if c changes at a value less than or equal to x. So, so, so if, if A stabilizes from 0 to X, uh, no, if A changes between 0 and X, then C also has to change between 0 and X, which is exactly to say the moduli functions are in this order. And therefore, um, therefore A Turing reduces to C, right, if you forgot how that happened. If you have C, 
then you can compute a modulus function like this because you know uh, if you have C, you know when an approximation to C is correct up to a certain value because there are sigma 1 approximations uh, and therefore then you can decide when A has stabilized on initial segments. Uh, so the complement is infinite, A is turn reducible to C. Uh, now we observe, of course, without this, satisfaction of the requirements was all obvious. With this, we need to now argue that this happens. So we need to see that if WE is infinite, then WE intercept A is not equal to zero. Right? It could now be that WE is infinite, so, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to argue what would happen if this is not satisfied. Uh, and that will show us why it is satisfied. Uh, if WE is infinite, but this intersection is empty, what does it mean? Well, WE being infinite means there are arbitrarily large x in WE. That's true of most infinite sets, right? You get arbitrarily large elements in there. But whenever such an element appears in WE, uh, it will stay in WE. So, so you have this element in WE, and from now on it's always in WE. So it's always a candidate for being enumerated into A. But we never get permission. What does this mean? Well, it means that as when you see this element X appear in WE, C has already reached its final value. Right? And so now we can compute C, because how do you compute C? If I want to know whether Z is in C, I wait until an X greater than Z appears in WE, which I know it does because it's infinite. It appears, and because it never gets permission to enter into A, it means that C has already stabilized up to X. In particular, it has reached the final value about Z. Uh, so that's that's I, I, I exactly argued this right. If it's infinite, but this is empty, then for sufficiently large values, we will never get permission to enter into it into A. If you don't get permission, it means C has already stabilized. And if you if you can compute a time when C has stabilized, then you can compute C. Which part of the proof is not clear yet? Yeah. Which part is? Is there a minimal simple set? What do you mean minimal? I, simple? I mean, can we? Is there a non-computable set such that any simple set that term reduces to it is also turn equivalent to it? It's in the smallest no. stage up from no, the because there is no minimal CE set. Right. Okay. The PCE sets. I, I, I guess I, I, I used this idea when I explained why this shows that these simple sets are arbitrarily simple. Uh, right. You know, but I, arbitrarily yeah. low because the CE sets are arbitrarily close to to zero. This follows from a theorem which we certainly should prove at some point: the density theorem. Uh, uh, between any two Turing degrees, you can find another one. Mm -hmm. We'll show that in particular is true for CE sets. So you can, you can get your CE sets arbitrarily close to computable. So you can always undercut it by something that's not turning equivalent? Yeah. Okay. Okay, good. Uh, on Monday, we'll analyze permitting a little more. In particular, we'll see sort of a most general formulation of what permitting is. And then we'll observe after the fact that uh, a Turing reduction between CE sets essentially can always be looked at as an instance of permitting. All Turing reductions are instances of permitting between CE sets at least.